Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to another session of the IKEA Foundation Ask an Expert. My name is Ryan Strauss. I'm part of the communications team here at the IKEA Foundation. And today we're here to talk about climate. 2020 was supposed to be about bold climate solutions. Unfortunately, the pandemic got in the way of this just a little bit. This very week, in fact, would have been the UN Climate Conference or the Conference of Parties or COP in Glasgow. And certainly many of us, including our two panelists today, would have been there. At the COP, governments and negotiators discussed how we can keep the temperature below 1.5 degrees to prevent climate crisis and catastrophes for the world's poorest and most vulnerable. Today, I'm very happy to welcome back to Ask an Expert, our head of programs for the IKEA Foundation, Patricia Atkinson. She's gonna have a conversation with two COP champions about their hopes and dreams for climate action leading up to the next COP, COP26. Hey, Patricia, welcome. Hi, Ryan, welcome everybody. So uh, every year when the global community gathers for a COP, someone from the host community is appointed a champion. They carry significant responsibility to coordinate partners on the ground and to ensure a successful summit. And today we're really pleased to have two people who have held or are holding the role of champion. Laurence Tubiana, currently CEO of the European Climate Foundation and champion at Paris 2015, and Nigel Topping, formerly CEO of Weeming Business and the current COP champion for 2021. Welcome to both of you. Hi. Hi, Hi Patricia. <clears throat> Hi, Patricia. Hi, Ross. So, uh, Laurence, I'll, I'll turn to you first. You are the, the CEO of the European Climate Foundation, um, Europe's foremost um, organization working on climate mitigation and towards the Paris goals on the continent. So what went through your mind when you heard that COP26 was going to be delayed? Well, my first reaction was, given the context, and knowing that a lot, a lot of effort of relation, interaction has to be conducted to get the successful outcome in in a COP that finally it was a reasonable decision and you know at that time we not only have the COVID crisis but as well quite deep and, and strong political headwinds with of course uh, USA because of the decision of President Trump to withdraw from Paris Agreement plus other government feeling that it was no more necessary to combat climate change like Brazilian government for example so I thought finally Anyway, we cannot do a, a solid work with, with the crisis. And second, it's really, we, we, need, we need time to rebuild the political momentum. So in a way, I was, I was relieved of that and, and happy that the decision by the UK government has been taken. Right. So your, your role as France's champion for the climate talks in Paris in, in uh, 2015 achieved historic and unprecedented success. We all talk about the Paris goals. Uh, tell us uh, about the role of champion and why is it so important to have a COP champion? Well, you know, I I do created the role, but before that I was uh, negotiating the Paris Agreement as a French representative, the high level representative for conducting the negotiation. And, and the plan we had with the French presidency for the Paris Agreement was not only to have government negotiating and in a way agreeing on commitment and goal na at national level and global level, but understanding that decarbonizing the economy, addressing the problem of impact of climate change could not be handled and addressed only by government. So very soon, already uh, in Peru at the COP 2020, and then of course in Paris, we had the plan that we need the non-state actors, the local authorities, the businesses, the NGOs, the financial community, along the government to take place in this big tent, to be at the big tent under COP21. And so, so that was the concept to have all the actors present in different roles. But we realized that uh, along the presidency that has to conduct the intergovernment process itself, we need somebody, and that's why we put that in the Paris Agreement decisions. We need somebody who really want to push this all, all, all across the board, all the society movement. And that was the notion of creating a champion. And of course, it was an experiment. We didn't have that uh, idea before. And, and again, the presence of non-tech actors was not in the process officially. So it was the first time. 
that thanks to Paris Agreement, we had, and it, that's very, very good, it continues now as an institution, that we have the presence, the formal presence of non state actors embedded in the process of the COP. So, so as the first high-level COP champion in, in 2015 with uh, Ms. Hakima al Haidt from Morocco, you're a true veteran of the climate movement. So we'd like to hear if you have some advice for Nigel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, many, but uh, uh, Nigel have been following that. So for, for, for him, it was not so new because we worked in a way, he was in the, together with business sector uh, when we prepare Paris. So Nigel, of course, has been on the two sides and he was very well prepared, in my view, to, to really um, endorse that responsibility. But my advice is, uh, in a way, uh, the first one, of course, is exactly uh, what he's doing all the time to try to align the objective of these different actors and try to streamline their commitments and to make them serious and really organize and to bring all these voices and the second challenge he has, which is probably for now for this year before the COP, now he has gathered the with the race to zero, I'm sure he will explain. Now a number of these references of being net zero by 2050 for a number again of actors, whether they are businesses or financial investors or, or local authorities, now that to, to link that with the official, the intergovernmental process, and in particular the, the climate plan on the countries. And this is very new, very delicate, very complex. But that's, I think, the novelty of the role of a champion, which is to go beyond this sphere of the governments to the sphere of non-state actors and making the connection between the two. Great. Um, so we would like to have questions from the audience. Um, so I encourage those, uh, submit those if you can. But I'll just ask you another before turning to, to Nigel. Um, so looking back uh, five years later on, on what you achieved in Paris, there seems to be a big gap between uh, dream and deed. Uh, what is your, your, your vision and your aspiration for closing that gap? <clears throat> um. On one side, of course, again, we have had faced a lot of headwinds. Uh, and still, of course, the climate plants who are at the table, we were at the table in December. And, and you know, that's why they need a revision of this plan by this year or at the latest next year. Um, they are not, of course, up to, to the goal. They are not consistent with the Paris goal of maintaining temperature well below 2 degrees C and being at net zero emission by the middle of the century. So the actual climate plans are not the ones we need, and that's why we are in a sort of big pressure to make them more consistent with this. But at the same time, in five years' time, again, against these very strong political headwinds, the economic and the political crisis, the economic, sorry, and the health crisis linked to COVID, we have seen in five years incredible movement. I can tell that uh, one on uh, now a number of countries are understanding what how they have to decrease their emission to zero or to net zero or who's counting on the capacity of the ocean or in particular on, on land and forest to capture carbon but at least they have really to put their emission close to zero for industry for transport for housing for agriculture uh, and this, uh, and so some countries are now plans. They are countries that have really practical plans to go there. And we have seen enormous movement to increase uh, this decarbonization of the sectors. Again, in five years now, we, we have seen renewable energy prices fall again and again. And now all the massive cap added capacity each year of uh, for electricity is from uh, renewable energy. We have seen electrification of transport coming in. Uh, you may have really uh, listened to the UK declaration of the prime minister. I, I think it was yesterday or two days ago saying that no new cars uh, based on, on, uh, on, on fuel would be sold in by 2030 in UK. And you, you, I'm, I'm sure you will see many countries rallying around that objective. We have seen really incredible movement and now I'm sure that Nigel will describe what is happening in the business sector. So on one side, we are just not there. We are running against time. It's, we, are, we are really late. And that's why maintaining the window of opportunity for 1.5 degree of increase of temperature is really, really very short 
the window of the window is very very will closing very soon but at the same time now the society the societies in general are much much more prepared the call many many power plants are closing there is no more finance for new ones in many countries so you see the i think the global economy has turned the, the point they are going in, the, in another direction but the stock of activities so huge with fossil fuel and so much government policies are still on the wrong side so it's a mixed bag but i do think it's nothing on the awareness and you know where consciousness and even plans nothing to compare with where we were in paris so paris has had, had a profound impact on the way policymakers business investors are thinking now uh, one, one follow-up question um uh, you've mentioned the role and the importance of business and of government coming together what about civil society uh, do they have a seat at the table at these cops <clears throat> you know without civil society and the science we would never have a paris agreement it's because the civil society together again with the scientific community have re really pushing all, all of us to say, look, the science is very clear, you have to act, it's now. And uh, in the COP, of course, I can tell as a negotiator, not as a champion, uh, I was really in contact all the time with the civil society, um, transparent, giving them information every 15 days or three weeks, having meeting with them, just trying to measure how much they can help deliver the most ambitious agreement possible. And I think it's still the case. NGO and civil society is supporting now, maybe the champion we have at, at world level, which is the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who is really the one pushing all government to go further. And that's because the movement of the youth, because of the Fridays for the Future, because of the civil society movement everywhere, that in a way is a real base of this uh, particularly uh, engaged Secretary General for Climate Change. So I do think the civil society is there to remember everyone that we cannot cheat, we cannot tell story, we cannot greenwash, we have to deliver. And if they were not there, I think we would be just, you know, repeating ideas and rhetoric and slogans, but we would not be acting. And that, that I think, is the, the real the real role and the real force of the civil society, in particular, the youth movement. Terrific. Well, that's a great message for our audience listening. Um, let me turn to Nigel now. Nigel, before your current role, you were um, a, a CEO at We Mean Business, and we worked uh, closely together there, um, mobilizing climate action from the business community. Uh, can you explain to our audience what role um, does business have in greenhouse gas reduction, and, and what is the influence that business can have on governments? Well, first of all, I should say th thank you for getting me. Thank you for getting me into this mess because it was the it was the IKEA Foundation um, helping found women business with a really bold investment that got me into this game really of what I now call radical collaboration. And and also I have to acknowledge Laurence's um, pioneering role as the first champion, which I learned so much from. And and I've written your advice down word for word, <laughs> Laurence. Um, so I mean, I think the role of business is 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 multiple right I mean, of course business is the main source of emissions most emissions come from our industrial and economic activities but also business is the the main driver of change because it will have to change its processes its operations its materials um, and business is an amazing source of innovation right it has huge wells of ingenious innovative um people um uh, and interestingly major businesses are truly global of course governments by definition are spatially concentrated and this is a truly global problem so in some ways is some ways multinational businesses are better placed to understand the problem because they they're, they're they see it in their supply chains um but but you know Laurence has talked about the, the, this what i call it the ambition loop you know the the, the policy makers are very nervous of getting too far ahead of citizens or businesses so they'll go so far but then if businesses all say we're going for net zero 2050 or a lot of them do a lot of well-known big businesses then it makes it much easier it changes the political space so there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship we talk about that ambition loop but but really it's about systemic change i just let me just tell you a little story to give you an illustration of that because laurence has just uh, talked about the the recent announcement that the uk is going to ban the sale of combustion engine cars in 2030. you know when we woke up with the sort of hangover after paris the International Energy Agency, the, the, the primary source of insights in what the future of the energy system is going to be, were telling us 
we'll still be buying combustion engine cars until the 2070s. You know, and then a business, Tesla, started appearing, disrupting. Oh, maybe electric cars can be a bit cheaper and a bit cooler and a bit faster than we thought. And then the, the UK and the French government say, oh, we're going to ban in 2040. And then some cities start saying they're going to have zero carbon zones. Then Mercedes, the inventor of the combustion engine, another business, says they'll go net zero 2039. And now then you have then you have young people on the streets and you have Extinction Rebellion and you have COVID-19 and everyone realizing that clean air is really nice and a human right. Then California says 2035. Then the UK says 2030. And as Laurent says, I think that that will, that will just become the norm. So we've gone in four years from 2016 to 2020. The future's come forward 40 years from the 2070s to the, to the 2030s. And I think that's the role that business can play as innovators, as disruptors, as, as emboldening governments. But they in turn are emboldened by what consumers are saying, what citizens are saying, what governments are doing. So it's a complicated systems transformation. But in the end, the change always comes exponentially. And that's the key thing that we have to remember. And that's why I think, I think the, the earlier question, maybe it feels like things are going really slowly since Paris, but actually now they're just really starting to rip into the future in a much faster way. And the, the death of the combustion engine, which is the, uh, the iconic technology of the fossil fuel age is a really good example of that. It's happened 40 years faster than we thought. Um, so, so you, you both said it's a critical year for more cro progress in, in, in climate, and and I, I wanted to talk a bit and ask you, Nigel, about the the uh, the NDCs or the nationally determined contributions um, that that countries are making, and and how much uh, increased ambition do you expect to see this year in the lead up to and and at the COP next uh, next December? Well, interestingly, if you'd asked me two months ago, I I might have been less optimistic but in the last two months it's now what's happened china have said they will be net zero before 2060 and china's got a very good track record of um under promising and over delivering um so and there's been a lot of really good research done by you know internationally and, and in china which shows that china actually could become a fully developed um rich country by 2050 and be net zero so actually i take that as that China, China, China actually starting to pivot towards net zero 2050. Um, Japan and South Korea, two very big economies, big emitting countries, also committed to net zero 2050. And to Lawrence's earlier point about coal, those three countries are three of the main financers of coal build in, in around the world. So th them, th them all committing to net zero is also changing the financing. We've had some recent announcements of an end of coal finance or moratoriums on coal in some countries. And of course, a new administration in China, uh, in the States, coming back into the Paris Agreement is is transformative. And that's why I think the, 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 the summit, which the Secretary General and the UK and French and Italian and Chilean governments are holding in in December is going to be a really interesting point. We're expecting that the EU commitment to be clear by then, 55% reduction at least by 2030, maybe a bit more. We expect the UK to announce on the day or maybe a bit earlier what their commitment will be and of course that so well, suddenly we've got i think canada have recently announced so suddenly you go from mainly political headwinds to uk eu china japan south korea usa uh, and of course well over 100 of the smaller and less developed and vulnerable countries have already committed so suddenly i think we're starting to see a real momentum towards 1.5 degree commitments and and then we've got another year still before glasgow to keep ratcheting up to get more specificity um, in all of those commitments driven by the private sector um, and by civil society. Right. So um, speaking of those countries now making big commitments, China, South Korea, Japan, and and what a new US president will hold, um, it's it seems like a job well done. Are we feeling a little too comfortable? <laughs> no, no, there's no, there's no room for comfort. We're, I mean, we're talking about a complete transformation of every sector of the economy. So it's huge economically, technically, socially complex transition, and there will be pushback and barriers and difficult decisions to be made at every step of the way. But but you can't do it without the end goal being clear and agreed. And it's also worth remembering that the, the International Panel on Climate Change, the scientific body that advises governments, only published their report on the difference between 1.5 degrees and well below two degrees in October 2018, um, so two years ago. And, and actually, really, that was really the trigger, certainly in the private sector and the investment community, to people shifting their 
objective from a two degree target to a 1.5 degree target. So, so actually, we've very quickly seen a pivot towards a much more ambitious. Remember, Paris was well below two degrees with best efforts to get to 1.5. What we're rapidly seeing, driven by the science and the and the activists and the technology coming down in cost, is us all reorientating around a much earlier, more ambitious goal. So it's definitely not time to relax. I don't think Laurence or I are going to be um, able to retire and declare victory in the next five years. But we've definitely got much more momentum than we had a couple of years ago. Right. Um, well, uh, again, questions from the audience, please. But I want to hear from, from Nigel, the question I asked Laurence about civil society. What do you want to see from civil society over the course of 2021? Um, I mean, I've, I fully agree with, with Laurence. Civil society has changed the atmosphere for governments. You know, it, min, millions of school children striking are all future voters to politicians um, and 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 peaceful protests driven by concerned, angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, um, uh, impatient, choose your adjective, citizens are also political signals. And I know I've spoken to ministers who have commented on that change and said this is a new political reality. So that so I have no doubt about that. Of course, those same people are future employees, future customers, um, and, and and the children of current CEOs. And I've heard several personal anecdotes of CEOs whose teenage daughters have looked them in the eye and said, mommy or daddy, you know, what are you doing about fixing the problem that you're a part of at the moment? Um, so I think I think civil society has a hugely important role. What I would really love love to see, and I think this is happening naturally, is is more specific engagement on specific measures. So I think you know, just saying do more is 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 helpful to a certain point, but then you've got to say what. So do more, ban combustion engine sales from 2030 or 2025. You know, stop um, funding fossil fuel um, projects overseas. Um, make it mandatory for all pensions um, to commit to decarbonizing their portfolios. You know, that, that sort of specificity of campaigning from civil society actually now that the overall political climate is much more um i think positive towards net zero is 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 what i think i really like to see i think it can really help okay. so um so with most of us uh, still living in some form of, of of lockdown at the moment perhaps this is a bit unfair for you to uh, pro project into the future but how likely is it the cop 26 will still happen in person and what are your plans in the event that that it will will still be living online well, yeah, let me speak to that because uh, um, um, I mean, I don't work. I, I was appointed by the UK government, but my, my role is this is this UN mandate. But I, I work closely with the, the UK's team and there's something they're really grappling with and, and with the UN secretariat. And I know there's, there's the, the, the youth mock cop happening right now. And I've seen some of the commentary there that, you know, if we can do it, then governments can do it. I think it's really important to recognize that the countries who are negotiating don't want to have a virtual cop. Because they're really concerned about um, digital exclusion, about asymmetries of power that arise out of virtualizing. So there's a there's a real commitment from I think all parties. I know from the UN and from the the, the Chilean and the UK presidencies to ensure that the negotiated part of the COP, at the very least, happens in person. I mean, and Lawrence, of course, having been a negotiator and knowing many of the negotiators from all around the world, could maybe. I'd be interested if, if, if I'm reading that right or if Lawrence has a different view, but the way I see it is the, the countries, especially the small, you've got to remember that if you're a small country, a small island state or a small vulnerable country, there's very few international arenas where you have real agency, not the G7, you're not in there, not the G20, the UN Security Council, maybe once in a blue moon you get a seat, but because the UN climate convention is a genuine consensus process, which makes it very hard to agree, but very powerful, those smaller countries have real agency. They have a real stake in the and a real role in ensuring we get to. Um, that's that's why we've got 1.5 degrees enshrined in the Paris Agreement. If it had been a G7 or a G20 agreement, you wouldn't have had that. But we had Pacific Islanders chanting 1.5 to stay alive, and that moral authority is embedded in the Paris Agreement. So I think we will have um, a um, a COP in person. I think that the, the the parties in the UK and the UN will fight to do whatever they have to do to make that happen 
for the negotiated part. I think the rest of it, the civil society and the business and the city engagement will be much more dependent on um, the state of play of COVID and vaccines and restrictions. But I think with what we're hearing about vaccines now, I'd, I'd personally be quietly confident that we will have um, a, you know, a rich physical experience. I think the last thing I'll say is we will also make sure that it's also a much more digital experience so that many, many more people can have um, a sense of being there and a chance to um, to be involved in a way that we wouldn't have fought for or imagined possible before all this learning that we're having under lockdown ourselves. Yeah, we certainly share your your hope for that. Um, we have a question uh, for for Laurence from the audience. Uh, um, how so, Laurence? How do you um, approach tri sector collaboration and the path to net zero? Is the question. <clears throat> I didn't get so. What kind of collaboration? Because I, I didn't hear you very well. Uh, tri sector, tri sector co-op. Ah, okay. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, what what is important, of course, is now to uh, translate net zero to particular pathways, both at uh, national level uh, and even at local level, because you see now many cities that has a plan for net zero, and then you have the businesses, uh, which of course the companies have to say how they would get there. And um, and so, what is interesting, and of course, the combination of this with the decision of investors to decarbonize that portfolio uh, in parallel uh, is really uh, really important. So, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, for the moment there is somehow a siloed conversation. Uh, the governments are talking to themselves. The business are preparing their sometime in coalition, sometime one by one, and at the same on the investor side, sometime in coalition, sometime by unilateral declarations. Uh, and then what is uh, necessary now is on one side that everyone plays its role. So for Glasgow, what is really important is a combination of all these actors, both government and non-government, uh, particularly on the economic side, present how they would go to net zero, what their plans, and in particular, what the 10 years action plans is to go in that direction. And I do think that then the role of the civil society, uh, which is already there, but could be of course much, much enhanced, is to check the consistency between all these commitments and checking the reality, both on the government side and on the business side, on the investor side, and begin to interact on, uh, in particular, the short-term action, which are so necessary. A big question about this absolutely central element of the net zero, and I, I can tell how much I, I insist in putting in the climate agreement the, no, the notion of the long-term strategies and the revision of them, because I thought if you don't have a goal, you don't know where to go. So it's really important. But now, of course, the question is, what do you do immediately to, to be in the right track? And so I, I see that combination of accountability, challenging uh, between civil society, and the, we should not forget the scientific community, which is will be again and again, and in particular before, Glasgow COP will tell us where we are and and how unfortunately how far we are from really being consistent with the goal of 1.5. So this is complex, this complex relation, very rich relations um, that are totally essential because as Nigel said, it's a ambition loop. Uh, it's because government understand that they have a backup. They have the backup of at least some businesses, not maybe maybe all, but many and that they have the citizen behind and so that's why i think it would be really great that cop 26 if there is a virtual part we have a good component of citizen directly involved we need much more citizen participation in the process uh, again because we we need to make the government aware that they are not alone it's not against people they are acting it's for the people and finally as as nigel said i, I wanted to come back and insist on that the physical meeting is absolutely central for the smaller actors. 
And if we were not because they are there and you cannot deny their presence and their right to existence, uh, we would never have had a high ambition coalition in Paris, the capacity of really putting a goal that, again, I can tell you until the last day, until the last day, until even the last morning <laughs> of Saturday, they were not prepared to sign up. And it was a very tough last minute discussion with all, all the major countries that they have to agree on the global goal. And I was, it was a very incredibly emotional moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, but it was because there was a small island there and the smaller country saying, you are, you cannot decide that on our, of, on our death in front of us. And that's very powerful. Yeah, yeah very, very moving moment. Um, Patricia, could I just please. share an, an anecdote which illustrates that? So at, at the end, when the gavel came down and then there was Laurent Fabius, who was the president of the COP, the, the, um, the French foreign affairs minister, invited comments from the floor. And um, Tony de Bruyne, who sadly know with us, who's one of the, the, the key um, negotiators and advocates from the small island states, this group of small island states who were, who were chanting 1.5 to stay alive because it really is existential. For them, I will never forget this as long as I live. He, there was, I was, in, I was sitting in the front, and there was a massive screen. So, I, you know, his face. So, so the camera went to Tony De Bruyne's face. You could see every feature in his face, and he looked Laurent Fabius in the eye, uh, and he said, "Brother Laurent, I want you to know that we, the people of the small island countries, feel listened to for the first time ever." And it was a very moving moment. You could have heard a pin drop because everybody there, like me, who is not from a small island state for whom this is not literally existential, suddenly realized just what a big deal it was. And that's why that's why that's why those countries have to be physically around the table because it totally changes the dynamic. Yeah, that's fabulous. Um, we have another question from the audience and and for both of you and i'm i'm really pleased to see this question come and it has to do with uh the the moment of covid 19 and uh leveraging the opportunity we have to 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 build back better um i'll, I'll start with with the uh, with you nigel um how can we use this crisis to pivot to a, a better healthier eco-friendlier approach for the future well i i, I think that COVID-19 is both an accelerator and a huge risk for this transformation. It's an accelerator because it showed us just how quickly we can pivot if, if when we have the will. So I think it gives us more confidence to go faster. It's given us you know, experiences of using this technology to do loads more of this engagement without having to get physically on a plane. I will never travel as much again. There's no doubt about that. I will still travel to do my job, but I'm able to speak to, you know, Latin America or Japan in the morning, Africa in, in, at lunchtime um, and Latin America in the afternoon in a way that would have required three global trips before, um, or I thought it would have done. Um, so there's no, you know, it will, it, it, it's, and it's also been an, an accelerator, an interesting way. We didn't know this when it started, but I've been really, really impressed at the way that the business community, the investor community and, and local governments I mean, city mayors are incredible, the way they've all said, we're going to have to do a lot of things different. So let's make sure they're all accelerating their move to a, a, a sort of green, resilient, prosperous, more equal economy. But but let me just flag the big risk as well. There's a massive fiscal squeeze on governments now because they're all having to, you know, save their own economies. And there's a huge risk. And you 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 guys will know this because it's your, your bread and butter as a foundation looking after the interests of children around the world. We could see 100 million people fall back into extreme poverty. We could see 130 million people fall back into being at risk of famine. So the shape of the global economic recovery is going to be really crucial. And that's not guaranteed. There's a lot of people working on it. I think America coming back in as a multilateral, multilateralist again, and the UK and Italy presiding over the G7 and G20 will be really important. But we must have a global green recovery, not just a green recovery in the north and then um, a, a three steps backwards in the emerging markets of the world. Uh, Laurence, uh, you at European Climate Foundation are working very actively on a green recovery. What, what do you see as the positive developments and the risks there? <clears throat> uh, on one side, and thank you, Patricia, for that question. On one side, and even if I was very concerned in March of the putting climate, environment, biodiversity in the back burner because of, of the pressing 
demands on maintaining employment and maintaining uh, the minimum of economic activity. So I was concerned about, about that. But finally, uh, I think at least we want the rhetoric. Uh, I'm not sure we want everything, but we want the rhetoric that the recovery is a massive public investment, in particular in the developed countries, has to go to more green than, than really the dirty polluting activities. I can say, and that of course translates into the discussion of the European budget, the solidarity between the different member countries, where there is a, a kind of, and there is a battle of these days, uh, a decision that the, the money that the EU will offer, will support, will borrow outside to support the countries who are in difficulty, has to be mainly uh, oriented to green investment. But it's a, I can say it's a big battle. It's not there because the argument of the actual stock of activities, the automotive sector, not the electric one, but the IC one, the airlines, uh, well, the industry like it is, they are arguing for the employment they have today, not for those for tomorrow. And so it's a, it's a fine line. I think we can probably make progress. Every funding will not be green. Most of the funding will try to do what we call do not arm, meaning is not really, but still we have subsidies for the fossil fuel economy already. So that is, a, a, in a way, a, a combination of uh, civil society, citizen engagement and business. And, and I see some positive development. But as Nigel said, the main issue is in developing countries who are really uh, on a very, very huge pressure of the debt they have to repay, uh, both to developed countries, to China, to many others. And it's both the private and the public debt. And if there is no solution, for that debt, they would not be able, these countries would not be able to invest in a green future and including to combine that with climate action. So the macroeconomic situation, <clears throat> the necessity to help them face uh, the these two combined crises, the uh, climate crisis, <coughs> sorry, with <coughs> the climate crisis with a macroeconomic crisis is, is really central. And that's why nowadays we see this crunch of economy and, and so many people going back to poverty. So the solidarity element would be absolutely central. We have another audience question. This time, how can local governments attract technical and financial resources to advance climate change mitigation and paradigm shift projects? Either of you want to take that? <clears throat> I, I can take it. Sorry, I, I have a little bit of asthma. So um, I think it's totally, totally central. I, I do think if we don't have the local authority pushing, and they are, and, and because they combine the management of the health crisis with some solution of mobility, uh, an increased preoccupation of the combined effect of air pollution, uh, bad environment conditions with the capacity to resist uh, again the pandemic, uh, that's really where the local authorities have the consciousness and they have some, some kind of capacity. So <clears throat> in my view, we still are far away from giving enough space to the local authority, enough seat at the table, but they are the one finally would make a lot of decision, in particular in the housing and the, and the transport sector, but as well, even on what is a food system that are really uh, something very important in the in the city and the, the collective meals, the way the norms, setting, etc. So I do think that in my view, the, the most, and I, I saw that in the US, for example, where the cities are well, well ahead of the administration. But we see that even in France, uh, the plan for going to zero in France are more advanced in many regions than the government is. <clears throat> and I can tell that in many other countries as well. So I, I do think there is a big hope because the, the urban citizens are demanding for that. And that, of course, is very part of the problem. And then we should not forget that in the less dense areas uh, where there are, the population is more sparse, we should not forget the territories which will be af affected by the climate action. So uh, just to let you know, it's very good that the cities and the big cities are pushing the ball 
And that's very important to have a seat at the table. On the other side, we should not forget the territories where climate action may appear are regressive policies because that would be a big shift for their economic activity. Great. And the one last question from the audience, I'll direct it to you, Nigel. Um, organizations that want to bring new solutions and collaborate, how 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 can how can organizations that want to collaborate uh, with you um, uh, join in in support for COP twenty six? Um, well, it depends what they want to do, of course. I mean, some, I have to be honest, I'm inundated with offers of help, which is great, but some, so, sometimes you need you, you need some resources to take the help. And sometimes, so, I mean, if people want to get in touch with me, they can just get in touch with me via Twitter or LinkedIn, or I can leave my, I think, um, ge generally speaking, um, I'm just reading the question about organizations demanding collaboration. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of, it depends what, if, if you're a, um, if you're an inventor or a, or a, or an entrepreneur, um, I think there's a growing realization in the venture capital industry that there's huge markets for solutions to decarbonizing sector after sector. I know there's a great um, organization called Tech Nation in the UK, which has a group of 30 um, net zero pioneers, early stage businesses. And, and of course, a lot of businesses have their own like corporate venturing. There's been a few big funds announced recently. I think, you know, fame, you know Amazon, Unilever. Um, uh, another so if it, it depends it depends what the question is frank in terms of the, the 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 kind of big idea but certainly feel free to drop me a line directly and if i can't help i'll direct you to what, somebody who i think can okay. so I, I i'd like a final thought from each of you in terms of your greatest hopes for for cop 26 and 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 i'd like you to try to express it in the headline you'd like to see um at the end of the at, at the end of the summit uh, nigel i'll start with you um, let, let me let, let me try and explain it and then give you the headline. So I think um, Lawrence has talked a lot about pathways. So my biggest hope is that we see COP26 as a pivot moment to war away from headline targets to much more granular agreements around the pathways to zero and the commitments and the actions to get there from everybody involved in that in that pathway. And and you know we're publishing those pathways now. We have the collaborations forming. Um, my vision is that we spend the, the next year building momentum so that by the time we get to Glasgow, we've got a pathway for zero carbon shipping with a critical mass of all the stakeholders, policymakers, civil society, you know, shipbuilders, fuel providers, buyers of shipping services. So if I turn that into um, uh, uh, a headline, I'd say, you know, uh, world agrees pathways to zero at Glasgow. Great. We'll come back to that in a year's time. Look on. <clears throat> my, my, I would certainly buy the headline of Nigel being net zero for everyone in Glasgow, and we have ten years to make this happen. So that the ten years uh, measures that everyone has to take and be accountable for. Terrific. We we look forward to seeing that a year from now on the front page of whatever paper we're reading. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us. And I think uh, from all of us, we wish the very best of luck to both of you in the coming year. You have a tough road ahead. We are counting on the, on both of you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Ryan. Great, thanks Patricia. And thank you to both of you. Again, uh, just an incredible conversation and really great to uh, be able to share with our audience a little bit about what's going on and give them hopefully um, a little bit of a motivation to act as well. As you say, with uh, the next COP, you'd love to have some citizen involvement. And I think it's up to all of us to really take that next step and 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 share what we want as citizens. So I really hope that uh, this is a, a little bit of a moment for people to reflect on that. That being said, um, we have, as a reminder, our IKEA Foundation podcast. You can check it out at ikeafoundation.org slash podcast. And this very Ask an Expert session will turn into a podcast eventually. So be sure to check that out and check out the other Ask an Expert sessions through there. Last but not least, a big thanks again. We're going to wave goodbye and we'll see everyone again at another Ask an Expert session in the future. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.